Hello, Homeworthy. I'm Linda. Welcome to the Cottage on the Hill. Come on in. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Be sure to visit our website, homeworthy.com, to discover amazing furniture, art, accessories, and more, all handpicked by our editors to help transform your house into a home. All of the items are inspired by the episodes you see here on Homeworthy. Enjoy! My name is Linda Vauder. I am here in a historic neighborhood in Oklahoma City. It's where I, I write, I produce media for YouTube, for Instagram, for magazines, for TV. Um, and it's just basically a place where I express my passions and experience the people that come in and out of my life. Well, this is, it's a 1930s cottage that was actually built at the request of a wife after she and her husband traveled to Europe and they just fell in love with this kind of English cottage motif. And it fits perfectly into this historic neighborhood that was primarily built in the 20s and 30s. It's got a wonderful, it's, it's like living in a Norman Rockwell painting. And the brilliance of it was that when we moved in, it had been completely renovated on the inside, but the outside was a blank canvas. And that was exactly what I was looking for. It was so interesting because my former home that I had lived in for 32 years, we had always referred to it as the fairy tale house. And when I, when I walked by this, when I saw it immediately, it looked like a storybook cottage to me. And later it was ironic because because that was actually in the description in the real estate abstract was that it had storybook cottage appeal. And it very much looks like a storybook and even my neighbors and especially the kids in the neighborhood refer, refer to it in that way. And I hope it becomes that much more magical as the gardens mature, as things begin to bloom and as we go through all four seasons. It, it was important to me that I felt like I wasn't moving away from someplace, that I was moving to someplace. And I loved the dynamism and the vibrancy of this neighborhood. It is very young. And despite the fact that it's an old historic neighborhood, it's in an urban, really hip environment that has a wonderful, a wonderfully provincial feel, almost European, because in this area, I can not only walk to all of, a lot of my friends' homes that live in this neighborhood, which was another impetus for me, but also I can walk to museums, I can walk to my favorite bookstores, I can walk downtown, I can see downtown from my front porch. Um, it has, it just has a vibrancy and a, and a cultural aspect that I love, great restaurants, great shopping. Uh, the hardest part of, of my walking life is deciding which direction I'm gonna go and what surprises await me because even though I'm familiar with this part of Oklahoma City, it nevertheless is a surprise to me every day. And so many young people, they call me, the, the young kids call me Miss Linda on the street. And so I, I don't have any grandchildren of my own. So there's a constant influx of little people that are, that are coming in and visiting me and checking out the garden and looking at the butterflies. So it's, it's not just a home, this is just a whole aura. It's a whole lifestyle. Welcome to the parlor. This is the first room you see upon entering the cottage. So it was really important to me that it was welcoming. I love the fact that it is completely light infused. It is saturated in light, which is especially important, I think, in the winter time when it's cold and you kind of get that, that sensation that you could be sitting in almost any chair like a cat in a, in a sunbeam. And I really like that. 
Um, when we moved here from our former home, it was really important to me for both sentimental, but also for practical reasons that we reused, rethought, repurposed the furnishings that we had in the former home. Now, could we use everything? Obviously not, but we could use a lot of them. And it was, I think, imperative that we thought of things in new ways to apply uh, their attributes to the decor. So in this case, this is a sideboard that used to be in our dining room and where formerly it held things like oak candles and napkins and well, server items. Well, now it holds things like hats and gloves and sunglasses. So it's very, very, I think it makes a statement, but it's also very functional. And I also like the fact that the tone of it really looks beautiful with the light wood floors. So to me, that creates this kind of continuity and harmony that's important to me. This painting, um, my husband and I, we bought it together. A lot of the pieces of art in the home were paintings that he had prior to our getting married. Uh, but this one we bought together. And what I love about it is it's an oil painting, but it very much reminds me of a painting that my oldest sister, Beth, did for us that was that hung above our bed in our girl's bedroom growing up. So it was it, it was reminiscent of that, but I also love the colors and I love the fact that it brings out the blue tones, the aqua tones, but also kind of that garden inspired thing that's so important to me. So it's got flowers, it's got fruit in it. And I, I really just love that. Um, one thing about all of my Christmas decor, sometimes people will say, well, well, what was, what was the inspiration for that? Well, for me, the inspiration typically starts out with a story. So each little vignette is a story that I'm kind of trying to tell. And I usually will put kind of a word or a thematic to that decor. So in, in this case, on this sideboard, I love the fact that I've got these beautifully carved wooden angels. These are pieces that I gifted to uh, my mother many, many years ago. And after she passed, I, I took them back home. And one thing I like about any kind of decor is that it has a, a Oh, kind of an experiential quality. So I want the characters in my stories to kind of be doing things. And so I will adorn them with maybe little halos. Um, in this case, she may be feeding the birds. This, I have to tell you, this is a sweet, sweet story. And it's so emblematic of what I love about this neighborhood. So this little angel is holding this little evergreen tussie mussy or a handheld bouquet. And this was made by my eight-year-old friend across the street who put this together and just one day came over and gifted it to me. So uh, I, Charlie is a good friend of mine and she comes over often and she sometimes brings me just little gifts. So it's important to me that this is placed in an area of prominence. So it is in the hand of this sweet little angel. And then items that I have out all of the time, I like the fact that they pick up on the thematic, and in this case, the metallic thematic of what my decor is. And this year it is, um, it's very silvery. And so the images I've got of my family, both when they were young and when they were older, wedding photos, those are important to me because, and they also happenstance fit into that silver theme along with like the silver garland that I've made little halos out of. And so it's just a fun, a fun vignette. Now, something else that's very important to me is we are huge readers and I love pulling out and kind of color toning the books that we have, whether they're contemporary books or they're old world books like this that we have collected over time. And one thing that's important to me about that is that 
we actually read these books. So I think all too often we fall into that trap of having things for decor without actually using them for their intended purposes. So periodically I like to just pick up one of these old, old books, respect its age and be careful with it, but nevertheless, read the books we have, use the things we have, whether that's fine china or it's silver or it's candles uh, that should be burned or just pretty much anything. What's the point of having things, no matter how valuable, if you don't use them? Because therein lie the stories to the things that you possess. Um, again, I like things that are both practical and pretty. So I have brass hat hangers um, and a wrought iron coat rack because obviously I want my guests to feel welcome. And so as soon as they come in, literally it tells them to hang your hat in my space. And I like the fact that uh, I, I'm a big hat wearer. And so I like the fact that the hats are in areas that are kind of public, which speaks to some of my signature style. But what I also like about that is that particularly members of my team, when they come here, when my family comes here, then they feel compelled to just pick up one of those hats and wear it on a particularly sunny, sunny day. They can pick up a straw hat and they too uh, can, can put on a chapeau and feel like they're part of, of the of the scene. I here's another example of what I mean about taking little stories or, or taking things that are fixtures in my home and making a story out of it. So I've got this fedora that belongs to my son, but I can imagine walking into the cottage. Frank Sinatra walks in, he has decked his hat, his fedora, with a little bit of holly that he just snipped from the Nellie Stevens holly out front, and then he hangs his hat as he walks in the door and he's singing me a Christmas carol. So every little thing is a story to me, and that's what what makes it meaningful. If I could do nothing else, if I could decorate in no other way, and this is what I mean about kind of accessible style and design, my artwork, my paintings, the things that had on, I have on my, on my wall, they would be adorned with fresh greenery from my garden. So these are fresh clippings of arborvita and more holly with berries that I can just walk out and I can snip. And the advantage of that is, is if it gets dry, I can just replace it and I can put fresh greenery in place. The other thing I like is that to the extent I can decorate the cottage with things that are natural, that are garden inspired, I don't have a lot of things that I have to put into storage after the holidays are over. I don't have a lot of things to pack up. These things are just literally compostable or they just go outside and I throw them into my flower beds and they have a second life as mulch. So I, so I kind of like that, but it also speaks to, to the garden and how traditionally over time people decked their halls with things from their garden. I also like the fact that they're fragrant and that also makes the Christmas experience experiential. So they walk in the door and they can, they can if I don't have a live Christmas tree, they nevertheless can, uh, they, they can be welcomed by the scent of evergreen foliage, which is just so holiday-ish. I have had several versions of this type of Christmas tree on my inspiration board, my mood board for I don't know how long. Some of them were in different shades of red. Some of them were in um, really traditional hues. But for me, I wanted it to be tone on tone. I want it to be gradations of blue and azure and, and tones that evoke a concept of winter wonderland. So for me, this story depicts a winter wonderland with the hanging icicles, the frosted pine cones, um, the globular forms. To me, it all, it really, really speaks to that. And the other thing I like about it is the airiness of it. So this tree, 
um, there's lots of negative space between each of, of the segments of branching. And what that does is it allows the natural light to filter through. It also gives enough space around each bauble, like these clumps of grapes. These are mercury glass, very, very old ornaments that I've had for a long time. I can then appreciate that that ornament in its isolation, but then in totality, I can appreciate what it contributes to the Wonderland theme and the color palette, color palette overall. And this color palette is inspired by the tones in this room, which are largely, they're blue. Some of them are deep navies. Some of them are inspired by the Jacobson painting over the mantle. And what I love about that is even though the colors may be may vary in intensity nevertheless there is this kind of rhythm and repetition of these hues throughout the space and i really really love that um, i think i mentioned earlier that i i like my gift wrap to match whatever the hue is of my theme and so in this case i have colors that are in in dusty snowy blues if you will and the bare branches of a sycamore tree and so they're in in taupe colors one thing i always like to do it's a signature touch of mine and that is let the christmas ornaments be part of the story so this is a winter winter wonderland theme so i have little fuzzy felt um, and soft deer ornaments and reindeer ornaments that I have positioned so that it looks it looks as if they are looking up in awe and it does take some dexterity to get them just the way I want them. But they're looking up in awe at the winter wonderland and the ice crystals if there was just an ice storm. And then I also like to use those ornaments or those baubles, again, whether they're expensive or inexpensive, to decorate the packages themselves. This year, I, I kind of happened upon what's a brilliant idea, I was looking at things that would match the thematic of a winter wonderland. Obviously, snowflakes do. So I found some snowflake picks that are like long wooden toothpicks that I can use on the bar, I could use on the appetizer table, but I can also use them on my packages because they can then hold my equally as wonderland snowflake uh, gift tags and things like that. So again, nothing expensive, nothing, um, nothing too valuable, but nevertheless, I love the way, I just love the way it looks. Love glitz and glitter and, and the reflection of that, not in a tacky, gaudy way, but in a way that illuminates things. Um, and that's true, I think, as a decor principle, whether it's around the holidays or it's any time of year, that uh, uh, if something looks a little meh, <laughs> if you've got a still life or a tablescape and it looks like it needs a little something, then put some cut glass crystal or put something metallic, something brass, something that will capture the light just the way I do out in the garden when I have some foliage of a plant that's matte or some kind of foliage like the hollies right now that have a very glossy reflective quality. The winter wonderland theme kind of continues on the light wood mantle and it's all inspired again by the seascape over the mantle and the colors of this room. So I just started looking at things that speak to my, my kind of signature look. One being I, I love and I burn lots of taper candles. I'm obsessed with taper candles and taper, taper uh, candlesticks. So I've got a variation, kind of a gradation of the colors in my taper candles that exist in the painting. And I have also done that with just some little humble, 
humble kind of bottle brush trees that I found. I think I got those, those at Target. And then obviously I also want my stockings to match. So this year, because I have new members of my family, I have two new daughters-in-law, I, I needed to kind of flesh out my stocking uh, inventory. So now I have monogrammed stockings for my new daughters-in-law and they are filled with things that speak to my tableau in the colors in the little ornaments and the characters, the wildlife, but also in the color palette down to that I have matched my candy canes, my candies, things like that to, to the, the, my color muse. And it's, it's, I think, I think it's appealing, but it's also practical because it's st the stockings are stuffed with things they really like, like dark chocolate and little goodies like that. I like to wrap tiny little packages that match my other larger ones and just kind of like tuck them into, into the stocking. So I think that's fun. And then I think lastly, we, this is an English cottage, but on an Oklahoma prairie. And so I like things that kind of evoke the windswept plains. And so I just gathered some leaves from my garden. I spray painted them in my tonal colors and they're just kind of scattered around the room as if they just blew in. Um, and then as we, as you either walk in the door or as you leave the parlor, then why not grab maybe oh, a glass of champagne or something that I would have set out to either greet you or to welcome you into the rest of the cottage. And so why don't we then go into the rest of the cottage, starting maybe with the kitchen. So one of the reasons that I was so attracted to this home in particular, and one of the reasons, quite frankly, that I wanted to move from my English Tudor house, it was, it almost had kind of a hunting lodge feel, but it was very dark. This is, it has the best light. So it's really kind of the decor is to a certain extent dictated by the quality of light and whether it faces south or north. Um, I really like an indoor outdoor aesthetic. Um, I am a rabid gardener after all. So, so views of the garden are very important. And as I would decorate, I try to kind of, um, oh, I guess compose the seating areas and the indoor vignettes, if you will, so that it maximized what you could see from inside out. Um, what was really fun for me in moving to the cottage was that I was able, I, th I think, to really play with a whole different set of colors in the Crayola box. So the quality of light here had much more of a gray tone to it. So I really wanted to pick up on pale blues, turquoise tones, and then happily it, it, it was it was just perfect because the Jacobson painting that we have placed over the mantle, which in my former home was in a, in a different place, just looked perfect in this environment. And it pretty much then was the inspiration that dictated the, the cooler colors that are in here, the icy blues, um, it's fun for me to play in the blue palette because I haven't really done that before. So in both my Christmas decorations and in the color palette, the permanent color palette of the parlor, it's much more in the blue tonal ranges. Whereas just like ombre effects in the garden, um, it's kind of a continuum. So as you head towards the back of the house, the kitchen, it's still very light and bright right but as you turn corners as you go into the primary suite or as you go back into the great room then it becomes much richer and jewel tone the the quality of light i think calls for things colors that are a little bit richer and that speak to an aesthetic that i really like uh, formally, I think we would have called that British colonial. Now I would call it kind of Anglo-Asian, but it speaks to kind of the global fusion of all of the different things that we have in our house, our love for travel, uh, my husband's love for anthropology and archeology, span and then certainly our love for books. So just kind of depending on what the room, the story that the room tells kind of dictates the decor.
Well, if the kitchen is the heart of the home, then you immediately upon entering the cottage into the parlor, then you come into the very heartbeat of the home, the kitchen. And I think one of the things that really speaks to me and that I was so attracted, attracted to this home originally was that the parlor is flooded by light and because of its kind of open, open flow um, floor plan, all of that light by extension then floods into the kitchen and primarily upon this fabulous, fabulous island. Now, kind of counterintuitively, um, right now I think the trend in home decor is to have a lot more color in your kitchen and, and not so much the white kitchen. Well, I guess I'm usually counter to the trends because I moved from a kitchen that had much more color, uh, had green cabinets, to this beautiful white gorgeous space which I love because it enhances the quality of the light and it also the white walls um, it just kind of gives a fabulous canvas I think upon which the art can play which is a big component whether it's something a painting that's massive like this painting of Monument Valley that hangs behind the kitchen table or also just the smaller paintings that kind of that kind of have meaning to me. Um, when you walk in, what I kind of like about it is, is even though this is an open floor plan, nevertheless, there's still a sense of mystery because you can't really see what is on either side of this entry that comes into this space. So when you come in, first and foremost, as a great focal point, you obviously see the massive uh, marble island that has, a, with a real kind of convivial quality because there's there's um, some wonderful leather strapped textural uh, uh, bar stools that you see when you come in. So that's kind of that's kind of welcoming. And then I have a focal point, a seasonal focal point. Uh, no matter what season it is, it doesn't matter. As soon as I saw this island, I thought forever after into perpetuity, there will always be a gorgeous arrangement of flowers or something on this corner. And interestingly, when I thought that, I also thought from a pragmatic standpoint that I was going to declare this a no dump zone. <laughs> Not only for my family, but anybody who comes in. So now everybody who enters my home, they know that this big expanse, which would typically be a magnet for people to just dump their purses, their keys, their books, their backpack. I, I have uh, declared it a dump free zone. So it is always open. It's always beautiful and it's always here for ready visiting and, and ready dining. So on the west side, or as I'm standing to the right side, when you walk in, you wouldn't really see that the kitchen table over here is actually a banquette area. And this has served us brilliantly. And it's also kind of one of those things that is an expression of, I guess, just how your tastes can change. Because heretofore, I had never really been a banquette kind of person. But when I saw this and I thought about how it could be styled, I immediately was drawn to the coziness of this space and to the fact that I could start using light tones in the wood, fin in the wood furniture and the wood finishings. And I got this table off of LitFad not too long ago, um, about six months ago. And then this is just a woven bench that I just love and believe it or not, I got it off of Amazon. So it, it looks as if it all matches, but it doesn't look as if it is a dining room set, which is an idea that I wanted to stay away from. Um, I also, because I like comfort and because I spend a lot of time here, either looking through cookbooks or reading or working or holding meetings, I really wanted a chair that would be comfortable whether I was dining or not. So this is an upholstered chair 
that um, doesn't have a whole lot of visual weight because it's white, which and definitely has been scotch guarded, but it's also on rollers so I can turn, I can visit with people here, I can visit here, and I just like the fact that it's a little more contemporary, a little bit more mobile, but eminently, eminently comfortable. And I like it that all the seating doesn't match, but it all is very cozy. Down to the things like the pillows that are stationed behind the table on the banquette. And the colors really match and speak to the, the hues that are in this magnificent painting. And a lot of our artwork speaks to uh, the area from, from that we love, the Southwest and, and the culture of the Southwest and the colors and the lights of the Southwest. An easy, easy decor idea is to just buy fresh wreaths. And if you have any kind of sconces or um, let's say you like to hang a lot of plates or, or something like that around your, around your artwork, then you just can hang over the existing piece a live wreath that let, looks very festive, but again, it's easy to discard after you're finished. And then I like the little punch of color in the berries that are kind of a, a color hue, a color echo to the colors in the painting. And then because to me, um, Christmas is all about, and the holidays are all about goodies and indulgence and chocolate, then why not, again, make something that you're going to have around the holidays and make it part of your holiday decor. So I love to go thrifting and practically all of the glass containers on this table were all thrifted or gifted and they just hold a variety of confections that anybody who comes into my house feel free to take advantage of. And then something else that's a wonderful decor item. One of my signature touches is I'm known for topiary. And so I love to use this rounded form that's repeated in the wreaths of an ivy topiary that I can have year round. I just take off the decor elements and I've got it year round. And then it, my, my table won't look so barren after, after the big day and the big season is over. And I can kind of have that beautiful, sparse, fresh after Christmas, uncluttered look. Now on the opposite side of the room, this is, this is really kind of a discreet area because behind this cabinet, I think it's very clever. There's a widescreen TV. We don't lot, watch a lot of TV, but I do like to watch my cooking shows and stuff when I'm cooking. So this is nice. It's very clean. It's very uncluttered. It's not in your face. So I can kind of keep the TV hidden, but it's also there. And then obviously I've got my, my great cooking zone here, which has all of the things I need without me having to travel across town to get to my stove, my refrigerator, um, my glassware, anything like that. There are subtle little pieces of furniture that are sideboards, that are carts that serve very, very functionally, and then highlight the workspaces. Now, one of my favorite things that I have done this year in telling a story for the holidays is this wonderful linear shelf that really, when you, as soon as you walk in, it draws your eye to the gorgeous, gorgeous tile. And I wanted to, I wanted to honor this space with some Christmas decor. So this is like, this is a little village that I set up with some of these wooden Scandinavian trees that have been gifted to me or that I've collected over time. Part of the story might be Santa is bringing me a topiary. You can see that he's holding that over his arm. And then this just became a little alpine village that uh, where the the cutting boards kind of replicate the mountains and the trees speak to the flora and fauna that would be in in the mountains and then it was kind of fun this is a fun very again accessible idea take corks and then just stick a little bit of greenery in them and you can make little evergreen trees that then contribute to and kind of fill out the forest you have 
complete with the little cottage church and the mountain cottages that are up at higher elevations. And then once you experience the kitchen, then I would draw you forth into the other areas of my home. I am completely self-taught and it's always important for me to let people know that because I would say my entire, I hate the word brand, but I guess my entire message is that really good style, really good personal expression, both inside and outside the home, not only in your garden, but in how you decorate your home and how you dress and comport yourself is all is, is accessible. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be uh, high design, but it, it can be thrifted. It can be made, uh, but it does require a keen, a keen degree of observation and attention to what a person really likes and doesn't like. And so for me, and one of the things I love about Homeworthy is that, that one of the messages it communicates is that there's not any one form of beauty. There's not any one form of style. There are multiple right, right answers, but there are certain design principles that help you convey and communicate that beauty that's very personal, which is kind of a long-winded way to say that for me, it's been a journey. I actually have an MBA. I was in the, in the business world for a pretty long period of time. I was a um, an educational marketing, marketing consultant. Um, I traveled around the country. I didn't get married till I, and start a family until I was in my 30s. And so, um, so my, my work life had, a, had rather an abrupt transition. And so I guess I like to think of myself as kind of a transitionista that tries to, as I transition, do it with style and grace while making a lot of mistakes along the way. So when I, when I got off of kind of the, the workplace treadmill of the business world, traveling a lot, I was able to express the domestic side of me, which had always fascinated me. I've always loved plants. I had always loved nesting and beautifying my surroundings. And I, I think then I had the luxury of time to express that. And I needed a creative energy. I needed a creative platform to do that. And so I love the word Shadowland. And so I would just, I guess, pretend like I was the Shadowland of my own home. I was creating beauty in it and a, creating a certain kind of domicile that appealed to me and that also was good and healthy for my family. Um, and in a way where I could, I could still channel things that are really important to me, education and reading and language and communication. And so I just started out by gardening. And the more I gardened, the more people would ask me to help them. So then I started consulting. And the more I consulted, the more I was asked to do things like a local TV segment and contribute to neighborhood and city and state events and my talents in that regard. Um, I, I had always done public speaking in my former career, so that was something that I started doing. If I could give advice to anyone who might be wanting to do the same thing is just say yes to everything. And over time, your platforms change. When I started doing this, it was all about TV and things, and now it's about, it's about YouTube and streaming and podcasts. And as the platform would change, I just tried to be brave and um, be willing to make mistakes and just transition with the times. And so YouTube became a way for me to develop friendships and relationships with other people out there who, like me, may be going through a hard time or like me, may be wanting to learn something and or like me who gets lazy and needs to be motivated or inspired. And so it just turned out to just be unexpected Unexpectedly, just a wonderful way for me to connect with people because I really feel very strongly right now that the world needs more community and and more relationship and more understanding in this and this gave me um, I sound like an evangelist and I apologize but it, it gave me it made me really be able to talk about things and 
and walk the talk about about establishing relationships and things. So, so it just, it, it progressed over time. Every year something new happens. I never know what's going to happen, happen next. It has helped me learn and try to age gracefully and to accept change with, um, with equanimity, but with also a certain degree of style. Right off the kitchen, we can head through a very, very tiny little hallway. I love the cottage because there's really no wasted space here. There's no long unused hallways or, or expanses of space. And I also like the practicality of this because once you get to be a certain age, you really like the fact that the kitchen is not at all far from the primary bedroom and bath. So just a matter of steps from getting out of bed in the morning to my morning coffee and then I'm in my bedroom. So as I said, just a few steps off of the kitchen is the primary bedroom. It's not really large, but it definitely suits our needs. I love the aesthetic. I love the aesthetic of this room. I love the rich colors of the bedding. I love the fact that the color palette begins to change. It becomes a little bit more rich. The high bed definitely speaks to me of that kind of British colonial, colonial Anglo-Indian um, aesthetic. It also speaks to the fact uh, of something that I love, and that's the fact that my, you know, my son lives in Singapore right now. So it has kind of a Raffles Hotel kind of feel, I think, that I love, along with the fact that some of my most prized furniture, whether it's old or new, kind of looks like campaign furniture. And campaign furniture was the kind of very mobile furniture that uh, military people would take with them so that they could readily set up a military campaign with little desks, um, surfaces, things like that, small chests. And a lot of the wood then, when you come through the room, it has that kind of campaign feel. In that, it's darker in tone. It's richer in tone. It really coordinates beautifully, I think, with the different richer hues that I'm using in here in terms of brick tones, mahogany, cardinals, burgundies, and I really love that about this space. I also, here's, here's kind of a tip, something that I have learned now that I live in a cottage that is smaller than my previous home, and that is to keep things fresh, I change things out seasonally. So as soon as the weather started getting cold, I changed out my lamps before they were light stone lamps and now they are rich and brassy and I think they give that kind of warmth and reflective quality that so speaks to me of the colder seasons. Um, something that in, in this room, I've, I've really got some things that are meaningful and sentimental to me. So the bench that's here at the foot of the bed, this was a Mother's Day gift. It used to be an old beaten up rug that had a hole in it, but I loved the colors of it. And my husband and I, for years, we strategically placed the furnishings in our living room around that hole in the rug. But when we moved and when I wanted to use it in a different area, area, then we just took it and we made a bench out of it. And I have brought from the other home, the other thing I like about reusing what you have is I've got these faux sisal rugs in here and in the parlor. And while the dimensions from the other house didn't match the dimensions here, we just had them cut down and rebound on the edge that needed revising. And so we were able to use those, use those again. Uh, this area is really is especially meaningful to me. So I've often said that this painting of this woman here, who by the way, was the famous mobile or artist Alexander Calder. This is a painting of his mistress that was taken many, many years ago in the 30s. And I love it because my husband got it for me, again, for another Mother's Day gift, because it very much looks like my mom who died at 36. And it's very meaningful to me. 
And if, if something happened to the house and I had to grab three or four things, this would definitely be something that I would grab. This is a picture of Canyon de Chez or a painting of Canyon de Chez, one of our pla favorite places to go to, to hike around. And that speaks to the beauty, the kind of rugged beauty we find in the Southwest. And then I just, you know, I have other pieces that mean a lot to me. Gigi Mills is, is a recent, uh, a, a recent obsession of mine. I love this painting or this print rather. We got it in Santa Fe. We get lots of our artwork in Santa Fe. So this space is just emblematic of things that make me feel warm and loved and cozy in the primary master bedroom. And perhaps most, most importantly is that I keep a picture of my, of my boys by my bedside. And then this goes into probably one of the most popular rooms in the house and laughingly we call the public bathroom. So I would say that my home is basically a, a setting for my passions and, and for my husband's passions. So for me, that, that would include gardening. So there's always, always fresh flowers in my home. There are always, uh, there are always books. There are beautiful, beautiful pieces of artwork that we've had for many, many years. I love the fact that it's it's not just an extension of my interests, but it's an extension of, of my family's interests over time. So there's lots of wicker in my home, for example. A lot of things were handed down to me from family members. I come from a huge family. I'm one of 10 children. So there, there are lots of things that speak speak to that, handmade items, things that, uh, that were gifted to me over time that are memories. I like to bring in lots of garden design principles into my home and execute them in kind of novel ways. So uh, layering is very important. Uh, elevation is very important. Things at different points um, in the verticality and the horizontal nature of my home. So I want it to not only be appealing to adults that are my height, but also to littles who are smaller. So that, that kind of uh, attention to elevation is important to me. I like things to be complex, but, but also simply elegant, if that makes any sense. And I like there to be enough negative space around beautiful things so you can appreciate it in its beautiful isolation, um, but also that the totality of everything is very harmonious so that it makes sense. And so if my home is a story, I want that story to be continuous and not abrupt. And so I, I love, um, for example, I, I, I love a Ralph Lauren vibe. My husband is, is very Ernest Hemingway-esque. And so I, I love that. And I, what I love about Ralph Lauren is the many iterations of the different stories he tells. So in, in one place, that story might be safari infused because that's, um, because that's something we love. We went to Africa for our honeymoon and spent three weeks there. My husband loves Great Plains Indian culture. Um, but then in, in the more pared down elegant spaces like in the parlor, I, I really like that too. So I, I am a person that needs different, um, I, I don't want everything to be the same but I want it in some ways to tell a similar story. And so that's, that's what's important to me. I, I, like, I like beautiful things, but nothing in my home is too precious. Um, I, maybe it's because I grew up in a family of 10 and both of my parents were children of the depression. There was great scarcity, but in my life, um, if something breaks, then to me, shattered feelings are much more important than shattered things. Well, isn't this fun? So these doors are actually windows to what once led to a massive porch. And when they redid this space, it, it found a new life. And it found a new life as an absolutely exceptional, dramatic 
fabulous spa-like bathroom. So upon entering, the first thing you see is this wonderful freestanding tub and these absolutely fabulous windows. One of my favorite things about the house are these windows, these wavy glass, old, old windows, these are casement windows that I could open if I wanted to, but I don't. Now <laughs> it's, it's important that I point this out because so many people, I often refer to it as a public bathroom because so many people come through here to see this bathroom space. And because whenever I have guests, Everybody wants to take a bathroom in here. Now, take a bath in here. Now, maybe it's because it's at the foot of a Christmas tree because it's illuminated by all sorts of lights and you can see the Christmas lights at night because it's just really a magnificent space. Um, and so we laughingly call it the public bathroom, but it's not so public that you can't take a bath with privacy at night because there's a remote control shade. So indeed, at night, you can light the candles, you can take a luxurious, luxurious bath, and, and to make that happen over here, underneath this absolutely spectacular gallery wall of photographs that were taken by a very, very dear friend of mine, of botanicals from around the world, again, kind of garden inspired living. I've got a table here and on the table, I have decanted things like bath foam, bath wash, shampoo, things of that nature, uh, bath salts. And if they, they just really want to indulge themselves, then they can get in here. And then of course, there's a, there's a little um, table here, teak table here, if they have to have a glass of wine while they're soaking <laughs> in the tub or hot chocolate as the case may be. When we hung the gallery wall, every measure was taken uh, to protect them from you know any steam from the shower any humidity they are under glass they are of archival quality and they are they are so so meaningful to me again because they relate to the garden but also to my deep and enduring friendship with my friends i like the fact that this has it has almost not only a uh, a singaporean quality but kind of a bali vibe my my uh kids and I, after they got married and my husband, we all went to Bali. And so I took a lot of, of touches. I stole a lot of touches from the places we stayed in Bali down to things like the orchids in all of the rooms. Um, and I, I, I just love that. I love the language that that communicates. A fun idea, I, I wanted to keep a blank space here, some negative space next to the gallery wall. Um, and I wanted to fill it with something vertical. So enter a, a clothing rack or a coat rack that I used here that we can use for towels that you can throw your bathrobe over. It would be great in a closet where you are, um, you know, you're hanging up your suit or whatever for the day. But here, not only does it, does it uh, house or does it hold my monogrammed towels and things, but I have noticed this year that there's a motif that I've been using over and over again, maybe because I had to get new stockings for my new daughters-in-law and that's just stockings in general. So while these damask stockings didn't match the color palette in the parlor, they definitely matched the color palette and kind of the vibe in this bathroom. So why not hang stockies, stockings filled with all sorts of wonderful, luxurious toiletries and things in your bathroom? And then of course there's a massive, massive shower that is almost like when we first moved in, I thought, oh, it's almost like we live in a, in a hotel or in a resort. And at Christmas time, at the holidays, no matter the size of the shower or the bath, I always like to hang eucalyptus on the shower head because you get a little touch of aromatherapy for the holidays. Well, I love this Asian stool. I, I wish I could give you more information about its provenance, but I really can't. All I know is that it was in the showroom of my husband's office furnishing business. And when, when he was cleaning out his office and moving locations, I said, it shall be mine. And it fits in, I think, 
perfectly with this kind of Balinese vibe that we've got going in here. And I also love, I, I also love the colors of the rug. Very, very rich, and it speaks to both the burgundy tonal qualities that I've got going in this part of the house, but also the lighter blues and things that are in the other parts other parts of the house. I, I actually got this on eBay. So um, when we first moved into the cottage, it was like rug roulette. Okay, what rug do I want to wear and what will most beautifully enhance and kind of synergize the message of what I'm trying to do. So I love it. I love this bathroom. I envision maybe having parties in here with some of my girlfriends where we get manicures, we get a massage, um, we drink bubbly. I just think it would be really, really fun. And, and I guess that's why we call it the public bathroom. But now I think I need to maybe take you to a less intimate space. So next, why don't we go into my office? Well, I, when it comes to holiday decor, I am, I fall in the kind of absolutist camp that there is a very, very strong, distinct line between Thanksgiving and fall and, and Christmas, Hanukkah and the holiday season. So I really don't like the overlap of them. I really like each each, I love both of them in such different ways that I each want, I want each of those holidays and those seasons to have their own integrity, if you will. And so I am someone that does not start my holiday decorating until after Thanksgiving. Now, do I start my holiday planning in advance? Oh yes, I keep an inspiration board in my office where I have kind of a mood board of how I want to express the holidays in that year. Um, but it differs slightly. Obviously it differs this year because I'm in a different location, but it kind of depends on, my life informs the decor. So if I'm going to be spending it in Colorado with my son, it might have a certain flavor. Um, I might go out all out more or less, depending on if I'm gonna be traveling over the holidays. Um, since my son and daughter-in-law live in Singapore, now there's more of, of a flavor, an Asian flavor to it perhaps than there's been in the past. So my family life dictates certain things. Just right around the corner from my office, if you go through this kind of, it's more like a vestibule than a hallway, though I do have it kind of decorated for the holidays. Um, you come past a closet that I use for, oh, you know, just kind of my china, things like that. And I've got other pieces, other works of art in the hallway. And then you just come into my workspace. And I, this is, I love about this. And I, I think that kind of the theme for this is in terms of not only my my work life but but uh, also kind of how it's decorated for christmas is that it is childlike because i think creativity is all about channeling your inner child and seeing things in a fresh fresh new way i love this space and i'll tell you why it's because i've got these great great windows it faces east I love the light coming through here, but mostly I love sitting here in my office and I can hear in the morning and I can see the little kiddos in my neighborhood walking to school and coming home from school with their, with their parents or on their bikes. It's so much fun. There's a great public school just down the street from me. And so it's very, uh, it's, it's like watching a movie. Again, it's like living in a Norman Rockwell painting. So it's also kind of a multi-generational room because while I am sitting at my desk to look at the kids, I am appreciating the fact that the desk belonged to my great grandfather. It was when we when we were cleaning out my folks house we saw it down in the basement it, it was covered with dust and everything it didn't need refinishing but nevertheless I, I once again I thought oh that shall be mine and fortunately my nine siblings were okay with that so I have had it in various offices over the years and another thing I love about it again is not only the sentimentality of it but the practicality of it 
because unlike a lot of desks you might purchase right now, this one is really large and it's massive. So I can spread out all of my stuff and I can really, I can really go deep and do deep work on this large desk. And then of course I can see uh, from my desk while I'm sitting there, I can see out the window. So the, again, nothing in here is overly valuable other than save the desk. These are just Ikea Billy bookcases that we installed and they've been brilliant for me because they can house all of my garden books, my garden library and other things that are really, really precious to me. I have lots of old wicker in here and this old wicker, well, I guess it's precious. It's very precious to me. It belonged to my mom and it consists of pretty much three pieces. I've got this very, very long, I guess you would call it maybe a sofa table that belonged, um, it was in the sunroom at, at my growing up house. And I love it because this is where I can put some of my prized topiaries. Right now, I wouldn't be a gardener if I didn't have lots of amaryllis bulbs getting ready to, to go into bloom. So I can stage my amaryllis, my topiaries, and they get wonderful, wonderful light. And then, because as I said, I get lots of visits from littles who come in here and they, um, they make me artwork. They make me, um, they, they make, Oh, just little goodies for me. So I kind of wanted to, to dress it up for them. So I've got ho, ho, ho garland uh, greenery. Most of the ornaments in here are small wooden toys. I also like to use Christmas decorations in not only innovative ways in kind of the decor, but also in my plantings. So why not use some kind of wood garland as a mulch for your amaryllis? Um, and maybe just, again, make kind of a story out of it. So this is kind of like uh, um, um, a little wooden village for, for the kids. And I've got my token little reindeers, again, who are, who are gazing up at what's going on. So uh, it's very efficient. Um, I've got a cedar chair chest that's off of it so I can I can kind of store some of my files and things that aren't quite so appealing to look at. Um, but lastly and perhaps most importantly one of the things that I added when we moved in here were these massive massive cork boards. So this is where I come up with my ideas, my inspiration. Um, I love the fact that when we moved into the cottage so many people gifted me with some kind of cottage motifs. So a friend of mine in Belgium made this beautiful line drawing of the cottage on the hill. A friend of mine needle pointed me a little ornament. And so this is where I had all of my Christmas inspiration and now slowly it's fading to things that will be planted on my color palette for the garden this year. But I love it because it, it just infuses me with ideas and a place to express them. Not an expensive idea, but definitely something that's really, really valuable to me as I work. Well, I guess I should, I should maybe explain when I talk about the littles that come into my home or the children that come into my home. I am not a grandmother yet, but I live on a street that has, it's so young. There are, I mean, you could throw a rock and you could, <laughs> you could hit a kid because there's, it's just such a lively, lively neighborhood. So I would say everyone, fr there's so many baby carriages all the way up to, you know, elementary school and, and beyond. And these, because it's such a walking neighborhood, there's a sidewalk that runs in front of my house. I have met so many of these kids and they have become a part of my life. So because the cottage is kind of a magical place, they're drawn to it. And so they, they may come over to show me their, the dress that they're wearing that day, or they want to come over because they want to see the butterfly flies because I, I have uh, lots of pollinator attracting plants in front and they come over and they want to see the pollinators um, and and the flowers that are attracting them. And so when they come over, I try to make that into maybe a little mini lesson. Okay, these are the butterflies. This is what they're attracted to. Here's how you collect seeds. Um, here is how you scatter the seeds. Do you want to take some of them home with you? I even have seed packets that I've made uh, specifically for them so they can collect the seeds 
seeds and they can color them. They've got a line drawing on them and they can color the seed packets. And so I'm just so fortunate that my neighbors have these kids that they are willing to share with me that enrich my life. And then my, my, my dear, dear friend who lives in the neighborhood, one of the reasons I moved here, her grandchildren live on my street. So they come by and they shout at me and they call me Miss Linda. And they are, um, they're, every, they're here as often as any adults. And they come over and they just knock on the, on the cottage door. And so when they, when they come to visit the cottage, I just want to have things that delight them. And, and I think about that as I'm decorating my house, both for the holidays and beyond. And then in turn, they do sweet things for me and they make little watercolors. They draw things for me. They draw pictures. And so I, even though I don't have grandchildren or young children anymore, I have a constant rotation of their artwork. And I, a lot of times will trade a hug for a watercolor or a piece of artwork. And it just, it's, it's one of the reasons I wanted to move to this neighborhood because it enriches my life in ways I couldn't have imagined. And a richer life is a better life. So now let's, let's move on to the great room. Yeah, I think what gives a, a home a soul is, is the, the nature of the personalities, the people, the interests, the lives of the people that go in and out of it and that energize the space. And so for me, I guess the soul is just basically the nature of the, of the people who come and go through it, of their interests, of their passions, of, of the things that make them happy and the things that make them sad. And it's not just family, it's, it's just kind of a, a, I don't know, a cohesion of, of all of the, of, the energies that come in and out of the house, both both good and bad, highly textured, and I guess that's what it that's what it is to me. Well, in my home and in my garden, I love to have places that I call gasp worthy. <laughs> So when you walk into a place and you're kind of, uh, of amazed and awed, either because it's completely unexpected or because it's just so beautiful or the light falls a certain way. And definitely I think the great room falls into that category because it's at the back of the house where I have the laundry room. There's another guest bedroom back here. And it's definitely the place, it's a gathering spot. It's a gathering spot, not just for our visitors and our guests and our extended family when they come, but it's also just kind of the gathering spot for my husband and myself, because this in the wintertime is where we have our cup of coffee. Now, when we, when we moved to the cottage, I had a number of must-haves on my list. And one of those must-haves was a wood-burning fireplace. Because to me, there is, it's some of the best money you can ever spend is to have a wood-burning fireplace. Great secrets are told around a fireplace, whether it's inside or outside. And I just think it's eminently romantic. And it's, it's romantic in a way that I think the rest of the room is romantic. This is very much, a uh, Ralph Lauren, um, uh, Ernest Hemingway kind of vibe. My husband is into anthropology and archaeology. We travel a lot. It speaks to our passions. The gallery wall that you see when you walk in from the back door is largely populated with maps that we have of all of the places that we that we have traveled around the world and i love that idea because it's a really it's a really easy thing to bring back as a souvenir. So we buy the map where we are and then we bring it back and we position it accordingly on the gallery wall. So a lot of these things are, are images, maps of things that are near and dear to us. Um, Colorado, where my son lives, 
Africa where we honeymooned for an extended period of time. Um, just beautiful photographs of places that we have visited. And the room is spacious, so you can not only feel cozy, but you have a place that you can appreciate all of the, the different layered goodies that we have tried and energy that we've tried to infuse in the room. Um, it houses largely, if my garden library is in my office, this room primarily is, um, is decorated with things that are the books, the tomes, the maps that are near and dear to my husband's heart. So on the far wall, opposite the fireplace. There's a really magnificent set of bookcases that look very old. They're actually reproductions of some legal office bookcases that would have been in an old timey law office. And they house some of our most precious books, some of our most valued uh, photo albums, um, different little artifacts that my husband and myself have gathered over the years so that belong to family members. I, we love using things, again, in practical ways that are inherently beautiful. So there are racks and horns that hang on the walls that then also serve as hat racks or in this case um, to hold some holiday decor. One of the few changes we made when we moved to the cottage in terms of, of kind of a structural component, this had a very large kind of uh, 50s vintage plate glass window that to us in no way communicated the vintage of the house, nor did it communicate the indoor outdoor life that we, that we like to leave to lead. So we replaced that door with four casement windows that we can open and shut. My husband is a man that loves to have a breeze on his face so we can sit in his kind of in his dad chair and he can smell he can smell what's going on outside. He can smell the wood fire whether it's indoor or out. And it also is just provides an excellent vantage point into the back gardens. So when we moved here, there was nothing here. We redid the outside. We completely redid the gardens in the front, but we also created and planted an outdoor living room in the back. So in the back, we have um, a solo fire pit. I have raised garden beds where I can grow my edibles. And there's a great big mosaic of a brick patio back there that again, it's just kind of an outdoor living room. So this suits all of our needs. Again, I said, we're, we're not big, t big TV watchers, but for the first time in our lives, we have a space that's large enough to accommodate a bunch of people if they wanna come over and watch a football game or, uh, or a Christmas movie. And we can be outside and hear that football game because we've got the casement windows open and it's that indoor outdoor, that fine line between living in the outdoors and living in the indoors. The, the slip covers are white, yes, but they have, um, they've been treated so that they're very soil resistant. We've had them for years and years. And then I have just tried it to kind of zazz them up with different things that are highly textured. They may be embroidered, they may be appliqued, they may be a piece of a rug and they just add to the feel of this that is uh, very Anglo-Asian. And then lastly, I think, you know, in, in addition to the touches of things like leopard prints and animal prints and, and plaids and things, which by the way, are not only repeated in the accessories, but also even in my gift wrapping, um, what, what Herman uh, Ernest Hemingway-esque place would it be if I didn't have a full bar? So there's a full bar here that we keep. And this is, I've got little battery operated lights scattered throughout the house. And then depending on the theme of our entertaining, someone can come in, they can fix themselves a cocktail, they can pour themselves a bourbon, and it's right inside the door coming in from the back 
entry, but it's also right inside the entrance when you're coming in from another part of the house. And you might want to escape with, um, with a beverage in front of a warm fire to kind of really experience the sentiment and the hygge of, of the season. So that's the great room. We love it. We love it as a place to gather, but we also like it as a place um, for solitary reflection, mostly just comfort and coziness. Well, in the past, I would say that home is where my people are. Uh, my family is, but now my family is far flung and lives all over the world. And so it can't be just where my family is, but it has to be maybe where my, by extension, my community is. And it has to be the, the, the nucleus of my world and the things that are important to me. So my home is at the very core and it's the place that people are attracted to. It's the place my family is attracted back to, where my neighbors are uh, feel welcome, where anybody that enters my orbit feels welcome. It's a place of security, it's a place of beauty, it's a place of respite, and it's a place of renewal and sustenance. So that's what that's what a home means to me, a place that I can leave but that I can I can come back to to be refreshed and renewed. Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.